Good morning. My name is Jerry Gordon. Today's scripture comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Kirk Nave, one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church, and today we begin a new worship series called Transformed. We will be looking at the mission of this thing we call the community of faith or church and what God is up to transforming us as disciples of Jesus. Today we will focus on loving God. Let us pray together. Holy God, each of us have come this morning hoping, longing to hear a word from you. You and your Holy Spirit are already present, so open our hearts, open our very souls, that we might hear from your heart and speak to ours. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What are you doing here this morning? Do you think of that on a given given Sunday? Many of us who are in the holy habit of coming to worship God don't even question it. But I was reminded a number of years ago when I was serving as the pastor at Stephen City United Methodist Church and one of my church members also happened to be my neighbor said, you'll never guess what one of our neighbors asked me to, this, this week. I said, what did they ask you? She said, we don't mean to pry, but We've noticed every Sunday morning, you and your family get dressed up, and you get in a car, and you go somewhere. Where do you go? And we kind of laugh, but there's a tragedy in that question. The reality is, according to Outreach Magazine, this morning, like any given Sunday morning, 17.7% of people in the United States will go to worship. Now, for those of you that are younger than me, I would share with you, when I was a kid, that's what everybody seemingly did on a Sunday morning, except my next door neighbor, they went on Saturday because they were Jewish. It seemed like everybody, everybody I went to school with, you know, everybody that I knew, virtually everybody was in some Christian denomination or other religion And the majority of people today, still 70-some percent, will say, I'm a Christian, but it's more like, you know, I'm Baptist or I'm Methodist because my grandmother or my grandfather was Baptist or Methodist, so that's my cultural line, not so much my holy habit. That question raises a couple of things. Number one is, before blaming somebody else, friends, we have no one to blame but ourselves for the reality that is We who come to worship on a given Sunday are a minority in our society. The reason I say we've nobody to blame but ourselves is because the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And it's very easy for us to forget that. The second thing to notice is that question from a neighbor asks us the question, why is it that you roll out of bed on a Sunday morning, get yourself all dressed up, and do this thing called church? It's a, very, it's a serious question. Sometimes it has comical results. One of the comedians that I'm into these days is a guy by the name of John Mulaney. He was, if you don't know him, he wrote for a number of years for Saturday Night Live. Now he has his own stand-up routines. You can find them on Netflix, I encourage you. But I will share with you that there's some of his, some of his material doesn't deserve to be shared on a Sunday morning. But he talks about his faith upbringing. He was raised Catholic, and he, he made this 
Interesting observation in his routine called Kid Gorgeous at Radio City Music Hall. He said, if you were raised in a church and you have adult friends who were not, they have all kinds of questions. Like, wait, were you forced to go? He said, of course I was forced to go. I was five. I was forced to go everywhere. No kid is just going to church. I mean, riding on his huffy like, whoa, what's this place? A weird Byzantine temple with green carpeting where everybody has bad breath. And I wear clothes that I hate on one of the two mornings of my days off. And I say, yeah, let's do this. Nobody does that. Why do we do this thing called church? We need to remind ourselves of the mission. And the United Methodist Church, in its book of discipline, says the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Just reading this morning's scripture from Matthew 28, you understand the basis of that understanding. These are the last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. He has already been crucified. He has risen from the dead. And he is about to be ascended into heaven. It's, you know, it's... It's the commissioning. It's like, this is what I want you to do until I get back, right? This is what you and I are supposed to be. This is why we do this thing called church, to make disciples. Now, the first question we may have is, well, if our mission is to make disciples, what's a disciple? I've actually gotten that, that question from some of our church leaders. Let's, let's try and wrap our heads around what we mean by disciple. So this is my definition. It's nobody else's. I, and it comes somewhat from the dictionary, but I realize disciple in a Christian context is different than how the dictionary may understand it. First thing I want you to notice is it comes from the same root as the word discipline. What is discipline? It is not punishment. There are those who use punishment in order to discipline, but discipline is all about pedagogy for all you teachers out there. It's about this idea of teaching and learning, right? That's what discipline is supposed to be about. And in Jesus' context, in his culture, in his day, the way it was done was you had a rabbi, teacher, and this rabbi would typically choose, handpick people that would be his disciples, his learners. Jesus wasn't the only one to do this. This is what the rabbis in his culture would do. So one of the interesting things about Peter, James, and John and the others who were fishing or in some other business, they'd already been passed over by their hometown rabbi to do religious stuff. And Jesus goes out and he handpicks them. And so they learn not just from lecture, right, or classroom notes and an exam. No, they learn by living with him, living under the same roof, eating the same food. When you encounter someone who's difficult, what is the Christian life? What does the way of God look like, especially when it's difficult? So they follow him. A disciple is a follower, an intentional learner, literally living with one's rabbi. So when we're making disciples, that's what we're talking about. Make disciples. Simple command, right? And yet how easy it is for us Christians to forget what the mission is. Because we tend to think that the church is us. I hear people talk to pastors and say, well, you're a shepherd of the flock, like an existing group of people. That's contrary to the mission. Do you realize that? The mission is not here, it's the community. The mission is beyond ourselves, beyond these walls. Each and every one of us are called to make disciples of others. If you're worried about that 17.7% who are in worship, think about it personally. When was the last time you invited somebody to worship here at Braddock Street Church? Right? Not everybody's going to say yes. But do we still do the practice? The reason we understand it's so easy, one, one illustration that I think of was a number of years ago, I was on a committee, a church development team of the Virginia Annual Conference, and this is a group to whom congregations will apply for funding. They've got something going on, they need some financial help, and so they apply to the larger denomination to help them out. It's understandable, right? Well, just like businesses, the larger church doesn't have unlimited funding. Did you, do you realize that? And so when people, a congregation applies, we might think of it as we were beginning to do so when I was on this committee, if we're going to invest a limited amount of resources, what's going to be our bang for the buck? In other words, how many disciples will be made in that place? Think of it in terms of the mission of the church. So this particular grant application came 
And they said, Kirk, why don't you go out and visit with these folks? And think about it in terms of whether or not disciples are going to be made in this place. So I came to this congregation who shall remain nameless for obvious reasons. The building was not located on a paved road. And you say, why in the world would somebody build a church that's not on a paved road? The church pre-existed paved roads in that part of the country, you understand? And so it was still a gravel and dirt road. And they had great needs for their building. They had a leaky roof, you know, and that meant the ceiling in the sanctuary was drooping. They probably had mold problems. They'd already been working on a foundation problem. But the reason they said they really needed the money was to preserve some graffiti on the wall up in the balcony. That's not something people necessarily want to preserve, but this was graffiti from Confederate soldiers when this had been used as a hospital during the Civil War. They wanted to preserve history. Now come at this from the question of what's the mission of the church? Did Jesus say the mission of the church is to preserve history? He didn't say anything like that, did he? But you can understand why people would want to preserve a, a heritage and so forth. But So I tried to help them understand where I was coming from, where the conference was coming from, and I said, tell me, when was the last time somebody was baptized here? And they couldn't remember. They could not remember. First of all, they looked at me like I was an alien from outer space, because why in the world would you ask that question when we're asking about preserving heritage? You see the disconnect. The mission is to make disciples. By the way, I, I suggested that they go to their local uh, hist historical preservation society and apply for a grant there you know that seemed appropriate to me rather than asking the church to fund historical preservation it's not that it was a bad thing but that's not our mission and that's easy for us to forget that the mission is to make disciples the scripture this morning goes on to say let's talk about making disciples by can I have the next screen baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit baptizing we had a baptism here at our 10 o'clock service. Baptizing is a rite of initiation. If you're a liturgical geek and you want to understand exactly what baptism means, go to page 33. It's the words that Joanna reads every time we have a baptism. Baptism is we are initiated into Christ's holy church. Initiation. Just like when you join a fraternity or a sorority, there's some kind of ritual that says, yes, I belong. Baptism is that for Christians. I belong to the family of God. The second thing that baptism is, is, is an act of salvation. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. God is transforming the world one life at a time. You see? That's God's mission. And we get to participate in it. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. We get a whole new orientation. No longer are we primarily oriented according to our family, to our mothers and our fathers or whomever. We are now primarily oriented to God. That's what baptism means. Bapti baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And most Christians I know, when they think of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, they kind of stop right there. And they miss the second part of this sentence, which goes on to say, and teaching them everything that I've commanded you. Because it's not about being baptized and say, oh, now I can wait for my death or when I go to glory or however you want to understand that. There's a whole lifetime to live with Jesus Christ. So Jesus goes on to say, and teach them everything that I've commanded you. And the interesting thing that, that Jesus does, whenever he uses the word command or commandment, it's always about one thing, love. Let's look at this next scripture from Matthew 22. Someone asked him, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. Love God. Love one's neighbor. That sounds okay, right? Until you understand the way that God loves. There's another scripture from John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another, take a big gulp, as I have loved you. How has God loved you in Jesus Christ? Sacrificially. He has given his life, his all. God gives up his own son 
to express God's love for you and me. This is the whole basis of the transformation, the power, the depth to which God Almighty loves you and me. He gives us life. He gives us salvation. And it costs God everything. And the way that he loves neighbors, if we're following him, living with him, there are no limits to the way he loves neighbors, right? Jesus loves people that his own religion have, he have deemed him, them to be outside the love of God. People like Gentiles, people like lepers, people like tax collectors and prostitutes. You find Jesus meeting with them all the time. He loves people of different religions. He lives, loves people with physical and mental illnesses. He loves absolutely everyone. He absolutely even loves his enemies. And I want to say, give me a break, God. Do I really have to love my enemies? This is my commandment, that you love one another even as I have loved you. It's all about relationships. It's all about love. This is how God transforms the world. So why are you here this morning? Hopefully you're here because you love God. You just can't wait to show up and say, I love you, God, by, by singing praises, by, by offering prayers, by feeling the presence of God's Holy Spirit in this place. It is about so much more than just coming out of a sense of duty. I'm here because Mama did, did this to me when I was a kid. You know? Hopefully you're in love with God. That's what God hopes for. That's what God wants of us. And so we engage in things like individual prayer on a daily basis and i encourage you if you're not in that habit do it do it do it please if you're in love with somebody what do you do at least you talk to that person and that's what prayer is an ongoing conversation with god pick up your bible pray the lectio divina do it in silent prayer what pray the lord's prayer whatever works for you whatever helps you connect with god but be in prayer your practices of giving are supposed to be based on that same relationship, developing that relationship with God. God, I give this back to you because first you've given everything to me. You've given me my existence, every material blessing of my life, and so I give back a portion to you. Not because the church needs it or because there's some great project going on. No, it's a discipline of giving that develops that relationship to say thank you, God, on a regular basis. Hopefully that's why you serve in the community in Christ's name. Not out of some sense of obligation, it's my job to give back. That's fine for some folks, but for Christians, it's because we're in love with God who loves us first. Hopefully, you're here to express that incredible love. And for me, I, I don't know, I grew up in a family of, of music. My mother was a piano teacher. I married a voice major. My daughter's a voice major. You know, music permeates my existence. But it's an art form that for me, helps me express love for God. And don't get into traditional music versus contemporary music. They both do the same thing. They hopefully lift us to the sense of transcendence. You know, that's why we always want to sing familiar hymns. So we don't have to work at it to know what the, the, the notes are and what the song is. We just want to be able to sing from the heart. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. Longtime musicians are probably tired of playing it, but you know, for those of us who are lay folks in terms of music, we love to sing it over and over because I don't have to think about whether or not my pot roast is done in the crock pot. You know, I'm just lifted up that God is in the room. Like Charles Wesley said, you know, if I had a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. That's where that's coming from. I want to share with you a piece from contemporary worship. It's written by John McMillan. It was made popular by David Crowder called oh how he loves us and when you hear these words you understand this is all about art and expressing a deep sense of love for god he writes he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realized just how beautiful you are and how great your affections for me. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us so. 
When you write words like that, you know you're in love with God. And every now and then, those of us who get to sing words like that or Amazing Grace or something, you know you you have this sense of passion for God because that's the root of why we're here on Sunday morning. That's what drug us out of bed today. We may not always think of it, but it's this loving relationship, this, this love affair we have with God that brings us here on a regular basis, hopefully to the point where our love for God is so evident it becomes contagious with somebody else. It's not always obvious. Sometimes it just happens in the mundane. But before you know it, somebody we know is saying, I want a piece of what you've got. And I'm going to tell this story, especially for our kids, our young folks, because I want you to understand you have the opportunity to witness the love of Jesus Christ to a group of folks, your friends, who are very open to it. When you get to be my age, folks like me, we, fig- we think we got the world figured out. You know, we've been around the block, we say, and it's hard to convince us of every, anything. But I remember when I was about 10 years old, I had a friend, I'll call him John, and we would hang out at each other's house. We were just school friends in Salem, Virginia. We would just play silly, silly games. I remember one, there wasn't a name for it, I'll call it Walnut Artillery. John had a walnut tree in the backyard, and we would just throw walnuts at each other. Not in any mean spirit. I mean, I wasn't throwing a fastball. We were just lobbing the ball over 30 or 40 yards. And each one of us had a trash can lid. You know, we blocked the, blocked the walnut, you know. It was harmless fun. Nobody got hurt. I did have stains on my hand for about two weeks. I didn't know the power of walnut stains. And we would just play and hang out at each other's house. And I couldn't help but notice that John's dad was not around. His parents had gone through a divorce years ago, long before I arrived on the scene. And it, was, it just broke my heart because his dad wasn't around. I mean, he still had a relationship. You know, dad had visiting rights, and he would go visit with his dad. His dad was a part of his life. But John's old, you know, next sibling was his sister who'd already graduated from high school, and he was like 10 or 11 years old. He didn't have anybody to relate to. His mother was there, but she was in a wheelchair. I don't know what her situation was. But it just tugged at my heart. And John would come over to my house as much or maybe even more than I went over to John's. And one day he finally told me, he said, you know, there's a reason I really like hanging out, at your fam- hanging out with your family. I said, what's that? And he said, because you got the family I always wanted. And he hung around enough to know what it was that made my family close. What it was that brought my family joy. It was our faith in God. It's what made our lives seemingly a lot easier than a lot of other folks and gave us, you know, just that joy around the table. And I left that town because the bishop moved my father, who was a United Methodist pastor, and I kind of lost touch with John. But I've got a friend that I'm still friends with today, and I probably will have lunch with him in Roanoke this week when I go for annual conference, and I'll have those conversations You've had those conversations. Whatever happened to so-and-so? You know? And it's, it's humbling because you realize the stuff that people go through in their lives. Whatever happened to so-and-so? Sometimes the answer is, oh, I guess it was about freshman year and they started getting into drugs and he developed an addiction. Or the conversation goes, what, whatever happened to so-and-so? Oh, she got pregnant. And she was a junior in high school and he was a real jerk and left her and she had to raise that child on her own. What about so-and-so? Oh, he did time in prison, you know. These stories come out. We typically don't hear the stories of folks whose lives came out okay. But I remember at some point in my friendship with John, I just said, hey, why don't you come to church with us? There's so-and-so who goes to our school, and -and so-and-so, you're going to see some familiar people. And he did. He took me up on it. His sister was dropping him off at church week after week. And he began to find, he found that love that was missing in his life. And I'm not sure what happened to John. All I know is when I ask, whatever happened to so-and-so, I've never heard a story like that about John. Now, Christian faith does not make us immune. I want to be very careful. It doesn't make sure that our lives are going to turn out great. It doesn't even guarantee that we won't make bad choices, you know, bad life choices later on. 
But for most of us, what's happening here is God is shaping us and molding us over time so that we have that kind of love and that joy that so many other people in our society are longing for. Are you in love with God? And are you willing to invite somebody else to share in that same kind of love? Maybe somebody will ask you, you got in your car this morning. You were all dressed up. Where'd you go? Let us pray. God, we understand that so many of your children are hurting in so many different ways. And we know the fundamental, basic foundation of existence is being in love with you. We pray for ourselves that we might have the right words and understand the right moment led by your Holy Spirit to invite a friend to experience the same kind of love that we have found in you. We pray for our church that we might continue to make many, many disciples. We pray that the way we love you becomes contagious in our community. Send to us, Lord, those folks who are hurting. Send to to us those folks that nobody else seems to want so that your love can bless us all. And as we gather to worship and praise and adore you this morning, Lord, we also offer our prayers on behalf of our neighbors who are hurting. We pray for Harold Ogg, for Alyssa Michael and Aaliyah Farquhar, for Joe Naselrod, for Denny Bromley, for Dick Harmison, Jim Casey and Ed Orndorff, for George Morris and Frank Shader and Harold Madigan, Bob Clater's family, for George Quarles, Scott Jackson, Brian Barnett, Robbie Robinson, Jessica Marlowe, and Bill Tilling, for Betty York, for Christy Hall, for Marvin Goodman, for Dorothy Gray, for Tay Rafter, and Barbara White, and for others whom we name in our hearts. We also pray for our neighbors, Lord, who suffer from floods and other natural disasters. We pray for our nation's troops and their families who may be left behind. We offer a special prayer of thanks for people who have been like fathers to us or grandfathers. And we pray for those who have fathered children, Lord, and for whatever reason have been unwilling or unable to be good fathers to their children. May we, the church, Lord, help to be a source of love and support where humans have failed. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.